Thank you for joining us for our final session of our series, Tracking Vegetation Phenology with Remote Sensing. Once again, my name is Amber McCullum, and I am joined by my colleague, Juan Torres Perez. As we've noted before, for this training, we have three one-hour sessions. So we've already had the first and second session, and today's session is July 14th. You can find all of the course materials on the website listed here. This includes a, a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation, a link to view the recording of each week's webinar, and a, the Google form for the homework is now posted online. So you can go in and complete that homework if you're interested in receiving a certificate of completion and you've attended all of the um, webinars. Um, there's only the one prerequisite, which is the fundamentals of remote sensing or equivalent knowledge. And we will be having time at the end today to, to do a question and answer session. I, I do encourage you all to type your questions into the Q&A box along the way, and we will address as many as we can at the end. If we don't get to your question, you can email myself or Juan at our email addresses shown here. As I mentioned, the homework is now available on the course website, and the answers must be submitted via Google Forms. You will receive a certificate of completion if you attended all three live webinars, and you complete your homework um, two weeks from now, so on July 28th. And you will receive the certificate about two months after the completion of the course, so do be patient as we um, compile all of those certificates. In the first two sessions, we discussed phenology and remote sensing. And then um, last week, we talked about some of the national networks and the ground-based data. In today's session, we will discuss some techniques for analyzing phenology data. And then uh, we'll provide some case study examples of multi-scalar analysis. By the end of this presentation, you will be able to understand various metrics and methods for evaluating land surface phenology and identify multiple applications for satellite and near surface remote sensing alongside ground based data networks. And this will be achieved through um, a few presentations of multiple case study examples that highlight things like the onset of spring, green wave modeling, comparisons of phenocam and VIRS. And finally, the effects of urbanization on phenology. Prior to discussing some of these case study examples, I wanted to first review some common methods for defining metrics. There are multiple key phenological variables that are estimated from satellite remote sensing. So we talked about NDVI in the first session quite a lot. By plotting time series of NDVI, you can produce a temporal curve that summarizes the various stages that green vegetation undergoes during a complete growing season. Such curves can be analyzed to extract key metrics about a particular season, such as the start of the growing season, or SOS, the peak of the season, or POS, and the end of the season, or EOS. These characteristics may not necessarily correspond directly to conventional ground-based phenological events, but do provide indications of ecosystem dynamics. And in some cases, they align really well. So you can see here um, an image of the start of the season for Kansas in 2018 with the um, dates of that metric evaluated in terms of the, the different colors identified here. The start of the season, or SOS, is really key to seasonal characterization, as many other metrics depend on SOS. In terms of remote sensing and NDVI, it's identified as the shift towards higher NDVI values with a constant upward trend. This is when the level of photosynthetic activity is measurable by the satellite. This can be a predefined threshold or a change in the slope of the NDVI curve. 
and we'll talk a little bit about that later. The SOST is the time or the date when you see this upward trend. And you can see this represented here in this image on the right from um, the Northwest Iowa Corn Belt, where you see the smooth NDVI and the raw NDVI values, as well as the indication of where that start of season is. The shifts in this figure are uh, represented by NDVI for the entire year. Conversely, the end of season, or the EOS, is the end of measurable photosynthetic activity. And the EOST is the date of the year that that's observed. So you can see that similar um, feature here. For remote sensing, this is when the NDVI value has a consistent downward trend. The maximum or peak NDVI can also be identified. The duration of the growing season can be used to identify shifts in the start and the end of the season under climate change. This is identified as the number of the days by the number of days from the start of season to the end of season. The amplitude is defined as the difference between the maximum NDVI and the start of the season NDVI. This is important to identify what increase of photosynthetic activity is relative to the baseline. These metrics are used extensively by the USGS. So here you can see the start of the season for 2017 as identified from MODIS data with a different color for each month for when the SOS occurs throughout the country. And you can um, obtain these maps for each year um, from the USGS. You can also access data of these specific metrics that we've, we've mentioned here, like SOS, duration, maximum NDVI, et cetera, via the USGS Phenology Viewer. And so this provides a dynamic online map interface that can be used to view those maps like I just showed you of um, the USGS remote sensing phenology. And these are produced on a yearly basis, as I mentioned. And in this viewer, you can actually zoom into a specific region of interest and download the maps and data just specifically for whatever region you would like. For identifying and evaluating these metrics, like the SOS, there are various statistical methods employed. So I just wanted to briefly talk about a few of the more simplistic methods for this. We will not go into a lot of detail of, of these metrics and we will not really discuss more advanced techniques, um, but we will provide a little bit of background as a, as a starting point and to provide some context for what's evaluated in the case study examples. Evaluating seasonality of vegetation requires a time series of imagery, like those figures we just saw, as well as ground-based information. And when you pair these two, you can answer questions about large-scale shifts, specific species variations, and the effects of land surface changes, like urban growth, on phenology. So as we mentioned in the last two uh, presentations, this is really key to evaluating seasonality and is essential to all of those topics we discussed. Monitoring time series of satellite imagery, such as Landsat or MODIS, was, was that primary concept of session one. And in order to identify metrics like SOS, a time series of data are needed. In order to establish and evaluate these metrics, Methods like threshold values, inflection points, rates of change, and delayed moving averages are employed. And as I mentioned, there are also more complex methods that we won't review here, but these could be things like curve fitting, um, principal component analysis, and, and some others. So if you are interested in this, I, I really encourage you to um, do your research on those more advanced methods. 
As we saw in the previous graphs, there can be a great deal of noise in phenological time series. Thus, noise reduction techniques are often employed. There are many different techniques to reduce this noise, such as filtering. And filtering techniques vary, and there are different approaches like the best index slope extraction, and others like Fourier transform. These are more involved and require some high-level statistical analyses. Compositing or merging maximum NDVI values acquired over typically seven to 16 day intervals can also increase data quality. Data smoothing facilitates time series analysis by reducing those noise induced peaks and valleys. So you can really see the difference here between the blue raw NDVI and that smooth NDVI. However, given the region of study, prolonged cloudiness can still present issues even when you have multi-day smoothing or um, compositing methods. For delineating the SOS, threshold values are often used. This can be done with a predefined threshold approach. For example, the threshold may be set to 0.1, and when the NDVI value reaches that point, the SOS date is indicated. This method can be effective for deriving the SOS in localized areas with relatively uniform land cover. But difficulties arise when using it to determine SOS over large areas with varying soil background characteristics or land cover types. In the United States, this value um, for the NDVI uh, generally varies from about 0 0.08 to 0 0.04. So anywhere within those um, values is where the NDVI is set to identify the start of season. There are also uh, relative approaches that consider changes over multiple seasons to identify SOS. So this could be used when the pixel values are greater than the long-term mean, or it could be a date prior to the annual mean, like 10 days, for example. Um, so this could be used when you have a longer um, time series of data and you have data from multiple seasons to compare your current season to past seasons. In this method, the multi-year median NDVI time series at each pixel is calculated. And an example of this is shown in the figure here. <clears throat> so this eliminates the impact of extremely high or low NDVI values. Afterwards, a threshold is defined as the midpoint between the minimum and maximum NDVI in the time series. In each year, the first crossing of this threshold was marked as the SOS. And the last crossing of this threshold is marked as the EOS. Thus, in this method, the threshold for determining SOS and EOS is constant over time, but it can vary among these different pixels. You can also do this process first or after some type of filtering to reduce the noise. So these lines here could be a smoothed um, filtered NDVI time series. But the benefit of this is that you can monitor individual pixels um, that are of interest to tie those pixels to ground-based information. Inflection points are commonly employed to identify SOS and EOS. And this, in this example here, is the um, point where the time series changes direction. Here the inflection point corresponds with the start of leaf expansion as indicated in this figure. When the curve goes from decreasing or unchanging to increasing, this is where they have marked the SOS. And when the curve goes from increasing to decreasing, this is when the EOS is identified. We will also notice that the inflection point method was employed in one of our um, four subsequent case study examples.
And finally, in our review of methods for evaluating phase shifts and seasonal markers, delayed moving average or DMA values are predicted based on previous observations along a time series NDVI curve. In this approach, smoothed NDVI data values are compared to a moving average of the previous N observations to identify departures from an established trend. The trend change is identified as the point where the smoothed NDVI values become larger than those predicted by the delayed moving average. This departure point is then labeled as the SOS. The end of the growing season is calculated in a similar manner when the moving average runs in reverse. Once these two parameters are identified, additional metrics are readily derived, such as the duration. So I know that was a very brief overview of some of these metrics and how they are established and evaluated. And as I mentioned previously, there are more in-depth techniques that we will not cover. Um, and I, I also want to mention that the, the technique that you use may really depend on your study area. Um, so this is not to say that one technique is, is better over another, but it's to say that there are many um, techniques available and um, it might be beneficial for you in your research to evaluate multiple metrics and see how they compare with defining these phenological shifts throughout the seasons. I also want to mention that for some of these um, analyses that we'll be discussing later with the case studies, there are links to specific papers for each of these case studies within the presentation slides. So you can go to those links and read those papers to get more information about these types of analyses. So now let's go ahead and jump into our case study examples. Um, and many of these examples are linked to the large scale networks that we discussed in the last session. Um, we will be reviewing some of the NPN gridded products first, and we will also take a look at um, some comparisons with the um, PhenoCam network. And it's my hope that these examples will provide you with ideas on how to use these types of resources in your own analysis. So let's go ahead and jump right into um, a more in-depth look at the NPN gridded products. As we discussed during the last session, the NPN produces data and products in a wide range of formats, including gridded real-time, short-term forecasted, and historical maps of phenological events, patterns, and trends. These include predictions of accumulated temperature or accumulated growing degree days and the extended spring indices. Accumulated temperature is a strong driver of seasonal transitions in plants and animals including leaf out, flowering, fruit ripening, and migration. For many plants and animals, there's a specific amount of heat that must be accumulated to trigger a change. And these are referred to as growing degree thresholds. If a threshold for a phenological transition is known for a particular species, then we can predict the timing of that transition if we know the seasonal accumulation of growing degree days for your particular location. And the extended spring indices, as we discussed, are mathematical models that predict the start of spring. These models were constructed using historical observations of the timing of first leaf and primary inputs to the model are temperature and weather events beginning um, on January 1st for each year. Both of these um, maps and data sets are representations of accumulated temperature. So oftentimes using these metrics side by side per, per, um, presents complementary information. Using the spring leaf index, we can answer questions like, how does this spring compare to normal? Watching this animation starting from January 1st, 
we can see the arrival of spring coming earlier with the warm tones in red and later with the cool tones in blues. And here spring leaf out has arrived across much of the country three to four weeks earlier than the long-term average based on that 1981 to 2010. In parts of the west, southeast, and northeast, up to three weeks, weeks later, oh, oh no, um, in parts of the west and southwest, we'll see that the, um, the arrival of spring is much sooner. However, in the Great Plains and the upper Midwest and the Northeast, we see spring arriving much later as we go throughout the year with the blue colors. And I'll just let you all watch this again as it populates. And you can see the, the date along the bottom here. Um, so you get a daily representation of the onset of spring. Using this long-term record of both observational and remote sensing data, we can also ask the question, how typical is this year's spring? To calculate this, the current year's spring index anomaly value was compared to the anomaly values from 1981 to 2019. Then to determine how often a spring was at least this early or late in the 39 years in record, are, those 39 years are divided by the count of the number of years that were earlier or later than the current year. So this is shown in the figure here, where the darker colors represent spring that are unusually early in green or unusually late in purple. And the darker the color, the um, earlier or later it is, so on either end. And this is according to that long-term record. And the gray and the white indicates pretty much an average spring. So you can see similar patterns here to what we just saw in the last animation, um, where you see parts of the um, southeast and northwest. This year's spring is the earliest in the 39-year record. And in parts of Nevada, Wyoming, and Montana, this year's spring is nearly the latest on record. So we can really see the, this nuanced effect of um, changes in climate to the um, onset of spring in different regions. As we've discussed, the spring indices predict the start of spring. And these are primarily constructed based on lilac and honeysuckle data. These species were selected because they're among the first woody plants to leaf out and bloom in the springtime and are common across much of the country. In an effort to connect the satellite and large scale land surface phenology characteristics to ground-based information, um, Track a Lilac is a NPN citizen science project. And lilacs, as I mentioned, are broadly distributed and are really quite common in um, backyards and are easy to recognize. So with a simple data, data sheet, members of the public can take part in citizen science and to track this phenological activity of lilacs across the country. You know, as we mentioned, we talked about nature's notebook last week. Um, and here participants are asked whether they see three different phenophases which are breaking leaf buds, open flowers, and full flowering. And those are shown here. These differences in the timing of flowering and leafing are due to differences in local environmental conditions and not due to differences in characteristics of the plants because we are looking at the same plant across different regions. Thus, these species can be used to systematically track changes in environmental conditions that can be related to the satellite and model data sets. So this is an example of how the citizen science ground-based information is pulled into the modeling of the previous two slides that we saw of, of onset of spring. Okay, so now we're going to move on to another example from NPN, which is green wave modeling. The green wave, 
or the flush of green that accompanies leaf out over the course of the spring season, as well as, as the spread of seasonal colors across the country in autumn can be tracked using satellites. This is one of my favorite visualizations from our NASA visualization studio. And this is the biosphere yearly cycle. And it shows plant life on land and the, in the oceans as indicated by NDVI. You'll notice along the bottom, the month designation as the um, little slider moves throughout the year. So if we first look at the Northern hemisphere, you can see the plants green up in the spring and the summer and then die down during the winter where we see minimal plant growth with lots of snow and ice. By contrast, the Southern Ocean and land masses show the reverse pattern in um, summer and winter. And this really illustrates this idea of the green wave. So you can sort of see the earth breathing through this visualization. Connecting and validating the satellite data of green wave distributions can be conducted through ground observations. The Green Wave Modeling Project is another one from NPN that uses this combination of citizen science as well as remote sensing. Using nature, no, Nature's Notebook that we talked about last week, the citizen scientists can make observations of flowering and leaf color. And in this example, um, the data was taken for maples, oaks, and poplars. And this helps scientists better understand pollen activity and the timing of fall color. Researchers are already using data that have been reported for these species to validate models that predict how changes in climate and how changes in climate will impact the phenology of trees, and also to learn that deciduous trees may leaf out weeks earlier under um, a warming climate. During the 2019 campaign, over 1,500 observers collected data on green wave species, so those three that I just mentioned, at nearly 900 sites. The onset of open flowers for 1,600 individual trees, the onset of pollen release for over 500 trees, and the onset of colored leaves for nearly 3,000 individual trees were recorded. There are many local phenology programs that are submitting data on these maples, oaks, and poplars as part of a group, group effort. There were also over 115,000 records this year added um, on green wave species from the NEON network as well. This map identifies the sites across the US in 2019 that reported yes to seeing open flowers. The colors correspond to the first day of the year where open flowers were reported at the site. The shape denotes maples, oaks, or poplars. Green outlines indicate more than one genre was observed at the site. This generally reflects a pattern of earlier flowering in the south and later flowering in the north. Some higher elevation oaks in the Appalachian Mountains and Western Oregon also had leader flowering. The results have also been aggregated by regions of the US and a time series of open flowers or pollen cones are shown for oaks in green, poplars in yellow, and maple in red. This figure for the Southwest shows the oaks first flowered at the beginning in nearly in January with a peak in April. The poplars started flowering in late January and peaked in March. And the maples started flowering in March and peaked in April. Additionally, senescence was also cataloged through the identification of colored leaves throughout the US, which is what is shown in this figure. Similarly, the colors correspond to the first day of the year that colored leaves were reported at the site. And the similar shapes and, and um, colors are used as the first figure we showed. You may note that some of these field samples indicate colors in leaves really early in the year, generally when um, we tend to see initial flowering. 
And this highlights some of the inaccuracies when collecting observational data. Some maples and oaks have young leaves that can appear red, which is why some of the collectors may have reported the colored leaves, which generally indicate senescence, earlier in the year than, than um, we would have anticipated. Here are the results for senescence in the Northwestern US, where colored leaves are shown for oaks in green, poplars in yellow, and maples in red. In the Northwest, a small number of maples with colored leaves were reported in January. So that's what I was just describing. And a larger period of colored leaves were reported from June to November. For oaks, colored leaves were reported from April to June, with a larger period of colored leaves from August to December. And then there were multiple periods of colored leaves in poplar reported from June to November. So now let's move on to another case study. And we're going to really come back with this case study to link the satellite remote sensing and the near surface data through analysis conducted on the comparisons of PhenoCam and VIRS data. As a review, PhenoCam observes vegetation canopy over a landscape at very high frequency, providing nearly continuous canopy status and enabling the estimate of discrete phenophases using vegetation indices that are conceptually similar to satellite data. Unlike conventional remote sensing, near-surface remote sensing provides imagery that is continuous in time, free of contamination by clouds, and also doesn't require atmospheric correction. As we discussed, a key issue with satellite remote sensing, for example, MODIS, is the coarse spatial resolution, whereas the digital camera imagery, on the other hand, offers the opportunity to either integrate the phenological signal across a whole canopy or identify individual tree crowns and conduct separate analysis for different species. At the same time, the PhenoCam network provides information needed to link what's actually happening on the ground and what is observed by the airborne and satellite sensors. Thus, data from this project will contribute to efforts in which remote sensing is used to scale from these intensely monitored sites to more expansive spatial domains. Here are some of the side-by-side -side comparisons of the data available from PhenoCam on the left and VIRS on the right. The PhenoCam network provides digital photographs every 30 minutes at most sites. PhenoCam digital images are stored in a JPEG format, and they contain red, green, and blue color channels. Quantitative data on vegetation color in three wave bands can be extracted directly from the imagery and transformed into vegetation indices analogous to those used in remote sensing. These include the green chromatic coordinate, or GCC, and the Vegetation Contrast Index, or VCI. On the other hand, the VIR sensor provides daily images at 375 meters and 750 meters, with wavelengths of red, green, blue, and near-infrared. The near-infrared band is that key wavelength that we use in um, the NDVI and in some of the um, EVI calculations. This example study is the first comprehensive evaluation of the land surface product derived from VIRS data and observations from the PhenoCam network across the contiguous US during 2013 and 2014. In this example, the team analyzed data from 80, 82 PhenoCam sites co-located with VIRS data. Here, I'm gonna provide some imagery and examples from one of those sites which is the Kanza Prairie site operated by the University of Kansas. Here you can see that this region is primarily grassland and the phenophases are clearly observable with green up and senescence of these grasses. 
The two maximum values correspond to the greenup onset, or that SOS, and maturity onset, or EOS. Transition dates of both senescence onset, or start of fall, SOF, and dormancy onset, or end of fall, EOF, are estimated in a similar fashion. So these four key transition dates characterize the start of four generalized vegetation growth phases, green up, maturity, senescence, and dormancy. While the phenocam cameras only collect data in the red, green, and blue, they can still be used to calculate vegetation indices, such as the green chromatic coordinate, GCC, and the Vegetation Contrast Index, or VCI, that I just mentioned. This can be done for each pixel within a region of interest at a phenocam site. The equations are simple ratios between these wavelength ranges, and those are both shown here. The figure at the bottom is an example of these indices plotted from that Ponza Prairie biological station. This shows diurnal variation every 30 minutes um, for both of these ratios. This figure is taken from the paper that we are using to highlight, and um, the, the link to this paper is here at the bottom, so I encourage you all to use that um, for more information. And in this study, they systematically compared phenocam observations to VIR satellite imagery to conduct sort of a, a validation analysis of the VIRS products that we discussed um, during the first session. And this is really a great example of the importance of both ground-based and remote sensing data. As we have discussed before, there are two primary vegetation health metrics that can be calculated using the VIRS imagery. These are the NDVI and the EVI. These both use the ratio relationship between the near infrared and the red wavelengths. The NDVI tends to saturate at high biomass, so the EVI is really useful for heavily vegetated regions. Here, the group used an enhanced EVI, which just uses the red and near infrared bands, as opposed to the original EVI, which also uses the blue band. These figures show the six phenological transition dates retrieved from the Phenocam time series at the Conza Prairie site during 2014. Here you can see the six metrics noted throughout the year with the corresponding Phenocam images. The top figure shows the GCC index values on the Y from the Phenocam, and then the date of the year in Julian days along the X. Similarly, the VCI index is shown on the bottom images. So these really show how the phenophase transitions like green up and senescence from um, the Phenocam measurements are evaluated. And so then here are the same time series figures from the VIRS EVI along the top and NDVI along the bottom. Visual inspection of the phenocam images verified um, similar temporal development. So let's just go back and forth between these two a couple of times so you can take a look at this. So between the phenocam and the VIRS data, we're seeing similar patterns emerge in these different indices. Specifically, SOS was clearly related to the timing of leaf emergence, and EOS corresponded to the timing approaching maximum green grass cover. Similarly, SOF, or start of fall, was associated with the start of leaf senescence, and EOF corresponded to that widespread brown grasses. So the VIRS imagery seems to be doing pretty well. Finally, these scatter plots show the comparison of phenology transition dates 
using the Julian day of the year between the Phenocam VCI and the VIRS EVI2 estimates in 2013 and 2014. In both the spring and fall, the VIRS EVI2 and the Phenocam VCI metrics were very similar. Regression models between VIRS phenology and Phenocam phenology indicated strong correspondence with slopes close to one. The results of this study demonstrated that VIRS LSP metrics are consistent and well characterized and validated using the near surface remote sensing observations available from the Phenocam network. It is important to note that these comparisons are not perfect and there are challenges in comparing data at these different spatial resolutions. And this would be especially apparent in a more um, heterogeneous system. So here we're looking at disrail homogeneous grassland area. And so these compare really well. But if you had sort of a mixed environment of grassland and, and um, forest, we might not see as, as strong of a relationship. But it is still a really great marker to identify um, these phenological shifts and how similar they are among these different data sets. Okay, so for our final case study example, we are going to discuss the effects of urbanization on phenology. Most of you have probably heard the term urban heat island or UHI. This describes built up areas that are hotter than nearby rural areas. The annual mean air temperature of a city with 1 million people or more can be anywhere from one to five degrees Fahrenheit warmer than its surroundings. In the evening, the differences can be as high as 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat islands can affect communities by increasing summer peak energy demand, air conditioning costs, air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, heat related illness and mortality and water pollution. These images from Landsat show the cooling effect of plants in New York City's heat. On the left, areas of the map that are dark green have dense vegetation. Notice how these regions match up with the dark purple regions on the right, and those are the regions with the coolest temperatures. Given the increases in temperature, in UHIs, the primary research question that many scientists have asked and thought about is what are the effects of these urban heat islands on plant phenophases? Changes to these processes can have cascading effects on the ecosystem. Additionally, UHIs can be used as a proxy for studying the impact of climate change on plants. For this study, researchers analyzed millions of observations of 136 plant species across the US as well as in Europe to study how regional temperature and the local density of people, which is used as a proxy for urbanization, affects plants, um, leaves, and blossoms. The ultimate goal here was to study the joint influence of urbanization and of regional temperature on median flowering and leaf out dates across a wide plant phylogenic spectrum. In order to acquire the over 22 million observations from across the US and Europe, the team used three continental level monitoring programs, the NPN, NEON, which are two we've discussed previously, as well as um, the US and the European plant phenology network for the analysis. This figure shows the locations of data points for leaf flowering. I've also included the link to the paper here, um, as I mentioned with some of the others, uh, where you can go to get all of the um, more in-depth information. And I've also included the link to the European Phenology Network. And this is something we haven't really discussed throughout this series, um, but you can um, go check that out if you're interested in that as well. 
And um, similarly, this figure shows the locations of leaf out. So these are the measurements. The previous slide showed leaf flowering, and this slide shows the location of the measurements of leaf out. So these were essentially the two metrics analyzed in this paper. The results from this work were nuanced. Generally, they show cities in cold climates triggering early spring plant growth and cities in warm climates delaying it. So high population density advanced plant phenology in cold areas, but this effect disappeared or even reversed in warm areas. Thus, the influence of human population density on plant flowering and leaf out really depends on regional temperature patterns. In this figure, you can see how population density interacts with regional temperature to affect plant phenology, with flowering on the left and leaf out on the right. The colored lines represent different population densities, with the y-axis being the me median day of the year and the x-axis being the average temperature. So this illustrates the differences in large urban areas in cool climates versus warm climates and the associated impact on flowering and leaf out. Separately, warmer temperatures and higher population density each spurred earlier springs. A 3.6 degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature increased the arrival of leaves and flowers by about five to six days respectively. A fourfold increase in human population density advanced flowering and leaf production dates by about three days. But the team found that when these two factors worked together, local temperature had an outsized influence. So in cold regions, areas with an average November to May temperature of about 18 degrees Fahrenheit, plants produced leaves and flowers about 20 days earlier in locations with about 26,000 people per square mile, compared with the equally frigid wildland. When an area's average November to May temperature jumped to 68, however, leaves and flowers appeared four to six days later in locations with about 26,000 people per square mile, compared with the warm open spaces nearby. In New York City, for example, Plants are likely sprouting leaves about 9.5 days earlier and blossoms eight days earlier than the uninhabited regions with the same temperature. In Jacksonville, Florida, in contrast, it's likely pushing leaf production later by about one day and flowers by about a half a day. Additionally, the team found that plant sensitivity to changes in temperature and urbanization vary by species, with the most affected plants tending to be short species with broad, thin leaves, such as the wake robin that's shown here on the left. Also, even though both are tall species, the tulip tree is more sensitive to urbanization and temperature change compared to the white oak due to its large, thin leaves. On the right is a tulip tree shown with its first leaves sprouting. The researchers noted that closely related plants generally produce leaves and flowers on similar timelines, but these similarities were erased by urbanization changes in, in regional temperature. So these nuances can make predictions of future shifts more difficult, especially under climate change. Today, we have outlined some of the common metrics for evaluating phenology, such as the start and end of season. And we've also discussed some of the techniques involved in time series analysis of data across the season to pinpoint the days where these events are occurring. These can be identified through time series of satellite or near surface images, and then compared with ground data. 
We also discussed four examples of how these various data types can be combined for a more holistic picture of phenological patterns. We discussed this year's spring in the US and how it compares to others, how citizen science can be used to quantify the national green wave, how PhenoCam and VIRS data compared, and how urban regions are affecting phenology. So this concludes our course on a general overview of phenology and applications of remote sensing data for these efforts. This is a broad and rich research and applied science area. And there are many more avenues and details for you to explore. This was really just a starting point. So I encourage you all to get connected in these national networks and to find other efforts throughout the world, um, which is something we didn't cover extensively here. So I wanna thank you all for being with us again today. We will have some time for questions. But if we don't address your questions, you can follow up um, with myself or my colleague by our email addresses shown here. If you have general questions about RSET, you can contact our program manager, Anna Prados. And um, once again, here's the RSET website where you can find more land-based trainings as well as trainings in other application areas like water resources, health and air quality, and disasters. So as we move into the Q&A portion, please do post your questions into the Q&A box. And I also wanted to mention that we'll be posting a document that contains all of the questions and answers to the training website once um, the course has been completed and we review those questions. I also wanted to mention that after the completion of this course, you'll be receiving a survey. And um, those surveys are really valuable to us to identify things you liked, things you didn't like about this training, and also to help us um, pick future training topics. So we want to provide topics that are really relevant to the user community. And the way in which we um, learn about that is through your um, survey results. So we do really encourage you to um, complete those and provide us with some feedback on this course and your ideas for others. So um, I thank you all again for being with us, all of you folks from across the world. And um, if you just give us a moment, we will um, transition into the, the um, question and answer portion. Thank you. All right, um, thanks again, everyone. And as we transition to the um, question and answer document today, I did want to mention that the homework is currently available um, online um, for the English version for you to um, complete that, but is not yet available for the Spanish version, but we will have that up soon. I, so I just wanted to mention that and um, you can see the link for it there and that's due on July 28th. Um, so do please um, complete that by the, by, by the um, deadline in order to receive your certificate. Okay, so um, we will get through a few questions and go just a little bit after the hour today. I know there were a lot of questions as usual, which is really fantastic. Um, and as we have done before, for the questions we don't get to today, we will um, write our answers in to the document and post that document to the website for um, future um, reference. Okay. Um, so getting started here with question one. The SOS, MOS, and EOS are produced on a yearly basis in the phenology viewer. Um, how do you deal with regions that have two growing seasons? Um, I think such regions should have two SOS, MOS, EOS. Yes, um, that is entirely true. And in that region of interest, um, whatever it is that you may be studying, you um, very clearly might want to have um, the sort of the like bimodal <laughs> distribution of the these metrics um, where you see um, green up and then um, the cutting events of the crop um, identified as end of season. So you clearly could could um, calculate these these metrics um, 
uh, multiple times throughout the year, depending on your crop of interest. Um, I think for the phenology viewer, they just do it once a year, um, but the USGS also has some more information and I've provided the link here about double crop and DVI studies. Um, so that is certainly um, something to explore and a very good point. Okay, for question two, um, could you recommend some smoothing method for NDVI time series? And I think this might have come in before we discussed a few of those methods. Um, these could be um, linear regression, spline smoothing, um, Gaussian function filtering. Um, there are many methods out there for um, smoothing of time series analysis, whether it be for phenology um, applications in particular or for other types of um, analyses. So I've included um, a link to the approach that's used by the USGS there. Um, and there's also a paper that outlines some other um, smoothing techniques um, for you to explore as well. Okay, question three. How to know the leaf expansion using LAI or leaf area index or just the peak increase in photosynthesis? That's a great question. And, and I, get, I think also gets back to that point of these different scales of phenology and the usefulness of different types of data. Um, because leaf expansion can be monitored through observations on the ground. Um, such as those input into something like Nature's Notebook, and then compared to <clears throat> the satellite remote sensing products, life, leaf, air, leaf Area Index, as well as um, the other indices like NDVI or EVI. Um, so I think that also gets to uh, that point of looking at these multiple scales, um, and you, can com you could compare um, something like leaf expansion and the timing of leaf expansion to then uh, the beginning of the increase in NDVI or identifying some type of threshold in NDVI that um, compares well with the timing of leaf expansion that you're seeing on the ground. Excuse me. <clears throat> Question four. What is the amplitude in phonology? The amplitude is the difference between the um, maximum NDVI and the start of the season NDVI. So it's used to identify what the increase in pho photosynthetic activity is relative to the baseline. And so this can be important um, for regions that may never fully lose their leaves or fully senesce um, if you have some understanding of the difference between the maximum and um, sort of what, what's identified as the baseline for your region. You can um, highlight the amplitude and you could also look at how amplitude varies over different years um, relative to changes in climate patterns, um, temperature, precipitation, um, things like that, that may be the drivers of those changes in these um, phenological metrics. <clears throat> Question five, have you heard of the Hodrick Prescott filter for noise reduction? If you have, does it improve on the analysis done on phenology data? And I am not familiar with that type of um, noise reduction. So um, whoever did ask this question, if you want to post a reference to that in the Q&A, we can um, share it um, with others as well. But that's not something I am I'm familiar with. Um, okay, so question six. Is there a methodology to compare time series between different years? Differences for long-term trends? For example, NDVI max is not reached every year or NDVI minimum is lower every time of year. And yes, so we talked about some of these throughout the presentation. And this also may have been an early on question, um, but time series analysis is really important to identify 
um, changes in these phenophase events, the timing of the events, um, the amplitude of the events, um, and various metrics. Um, oftentimes, threshold values are used. Um, so you could, for example, set your threshold value to a certain um, number, and then when the NDVI reaches that point, you could note the SOS. And, and this might be different um, depending on your year or your region of interest. Um, and this, this is really useful for regions that are um, localized with uniform land cover. Um, and that, that's an important point because if the region is very um, heterogeneous, uh, you're going to see uh, differences in the timing of these events based on um, what types of species you're viewing um, through, say, the satellite data, for example, within one of these pixels or small regions. Um, you, there are difficulties when using <clears throat> this technique, uh, depending on the soil background characteristics. Um, I've identified the uh, values that are generally used as the threshold values for the, the United States. Um, you could also use a relative approach from year to year. Um, so that kind of gets to your questions of um, the, the variability in the NDVI values from year to year. Um, and this can help you identify um, multiple seasons of change and differences amongst multiple seasons. Um, and then the, the multi-year median NDVI, which we mentioned, um, can also be used to el eliminate um, those extreme values or those really high or low NDVI years um, as well. Um, and, and of course, filtering techniques to reduce the noise can also help to benefit for those types of studies. Okay, so question seven. How can these methods be applied to perennial crops in tropical areas where changes in canopy are not as marked as in temperate zones? And that's a really great question. Um, as the greenness of the plants in tropical zones uh, may not change much throughout the year. Um, and this is, this is not my area of expertise, so I will not um, uh, provide really much feedback here, but um, I have seen some research done where um, they've looked at seasonality of gross primary productivity alongside EVI, which is more sensitive to changes in vegetation health especially in these re tropical regions where we tend to see high biomass. Um, and I included a link to a uh, floodplain, uh, Amazon floodplain forest uh, paper where um, they use those approaches of GPP alongside EVI and alongside ground-based data, which is always very important. Um, another thing to note that we see very often in tropical regions are clouds um, and so optical imagery is oftentimes not ideal for those regions, um, and SAR imagery, radar type Im imagery um, can be more useful. So I've included a link um, also to our uh, SAR forest mapping training that we did recently, um, and some of these techniques may be more useful um, for those regions as well. Okay. Um, question eight, is there any role to decide the target wavelength for NDVI calculation? For example, some researchers use um, 647 nanometers as red and 857 nanometers as near infrared, but some apply uh, 680 as red and 800 as near infrared. Can you explain what the specific rule is to select the appropriate wavelength for NDVI and other vegetation indices? So this is a very specific question, but I think it, it also might depend on what sensor you're using and the wavelength range for those sensors. Um, for uh, Landsat, for example, the wavelength range is uh, pretty wide. Um, and so you're, you're really only going to use the um, near infrared as the, the range of 845 to 855 and the red as um, 630 to 680. But for MODIS, those wavelength ranges are a bit smaller. 
So you could probably make some decisions based on your type of vegetation that you're interested in, um, what is uh, reflecting higher in the, the those different um, wavelength uh, bands that are within the red and near infrared. Um, and I would also say that uh, for for some studies, if you're interested in a specific type of vegetation, hyperspectral data may be more uh, interesting to you. Um, and hyperspectral data will definitely allow you to make those decisions of, um, you know, do, do I choose the 647 versus the 680? Um, however, uh, things like Landsat don't have that kind of um, spectral uh, high resolution. I, I also want to mention that we are, um, we get a lot of questions about hyperspectral data and we're considering a hyperspectral training for next year. Um, so do stay tuned. Um, it, it's definitely a question we get very often because um, sensors like Landsat don't provide us with that uh, type of spectral resolution to identify things like uh, the differences in species um, of, of plants. And so looking at things like invasive species or these slight variations in um, green up amongst different um, vegetation species can be quite difficult um, with some of these um, lower resolution spectral resolution sensors so um, do stay tuned for that i hope that we can um, do something along those lines in the future um, okay so question nine also, some researchers, <clears throat> oh, I think this is related to question eight. Some researchers average the reflectance values over the specific range of wavelengths <clears throat> before calculating the vegetation index, but some calculate the index for each wavelength and then average for the target wavelength. Uh, which one is recommended? And again, I think that just really depends on the sensor you're using and um, the data you're, you're looking at and your, your region of interest. So, for example, if you're using Landsat data, I would probably recommend the latter, where you're calculating the index using just those specific one um, bands for each of those wavelengths, and then um, and then maybe looking at the average or the the median um, uh, value of the index that you're calculating. But if you're using something like hyperspectral data, you may um, consider um, using the the former. Um, so um, you, taking multiple bands within that range of red, near infrared and averaging them and then doing your calculation. Um, but for Landsat, I would probably recommend the, the second option there. And probably for MODIS as well. <clears throat> okay, how do you eliminate cloud impact on NDVI? That's a great question. Um, and the, some of the approaches that are used as to, uh, are to use uh, multi-day um, composites where, for example, if you're looking at a MODIS image um, and you have a daily um, MODIS values and you identify pixels with clouds, you might um, take the good pixel within a seven day, eight day window, 16 day window, um, and create um, a composite image um, without clouds or with limited clouds. Um, again, this is a this is a real issue in tropical regions in particular with optical data. Um, you could also do something like cloud masking, where you just remove those pixels from the analysis um, if you're unable to find a non-cloudy uh, pixel value for that region over uh, multiple days. Um, you know, and, and I think it also uh, relates back to the idea of phonology and when we see these events occurring, um, if you have a composite image that is over too many days, you might be missing these, these important events and the timing of these events. Um, so cloud masking might be an appropriate method for um, for that, or using different types of data, like those we didn't discuss here, like, like SAR data. Okay, <clears throat> question 11. What other methods of LSP can be adopted for evaluation outside the USA? 
Um, similar approaches can be used uh, for regions outside of the US. Um, there may not be the extensive network of ground-based data um, like the those available with the National Phenology Network, but um, you could clearly use things like NDVI or EVI globally. Um, uh, most of the NASA data are available globally. It would just be a matter of regional um, networks of ground-based data to compare those satellite-based uh, land, the land surface phenology um, to. Okay. So, uh, question 12. Is the GDD or growing degree day significant to crop growth for tropical countries which are high temperature regions? Now that's another um, really good point. Um, the growing degree days may be more useful in temperate climates as we see a um, wider range of temperature data through temperatures throughout the year as opposed to in, in tropical regions. Um, however, if you do have some um, slight modifications in temperature, um, some variability in temperature throughout the year, you could um, identify a baseline um, temperature for the start of growing degree days um, based on your ecosystem of interest. So it may, you know, be a higher temperature uh, threshold that you set to start to identify growing degree days. Um, but I'm not sure how often that metric is really used in tropical regions. Um, it seems like it would be much more um, useful in temperate regions, um, but I'm not aware of the um, tropical research. Um, okay, I think we'll do a couple more. We'll go to about um, 15 after the hour, um, and then I'll, I'll get to the rest of them and um, answer them. Um, and provide them on the website uh, at a later date as well. Okay, so question 13. Um, I do analysis mostly on landscape level and its pattern change. Does phenological study play a role in this or not? If yes, kindly explain. Also, which kind of data would be useful for this? So, I think this question is really um, getting at those different scales of um, data that we've described throughout this training. And again, it really depends on how large your area is. Um, if you're looking at uh, a region, say smaller than 30 meter by 30 meters, um, none of the remote sensing products that we've outlined here will be very useful for you. Um, and in that case, you may wanna um, think about near surface uh, data like um, something like a phenocam or uh, drones or airborne data um, that may be more useful to compare to ground-based information. Um, and, and yes, that's a clear limitation of NASA data. Um, if, you're, if you're interested in very small regions, um, you may see some uh, mixing of the uh, spectral values that you get from one pixel. Um, I know that this is uh, oftentimes an issue with riparian areas alongside rivers where you, you may get um, portions of the water and the land um, interacting together um, in, the, in the single pixel signal. Um, so there are a lot of challenges for smaller regions if you're using NASA remote sensing data. Um, but there are other options, uh, like I mentioned, um, near surface, remote sensing, drones, um, aerial imagery, commercial data, um, which we didn't talk about here, can oftentimes uh, be very useful for smaller regions. Um, you know, things like the um, uh, satellites coming out of planet, um, uh, things like, or things from um, uh, digital globe, like Worldview 2 data, um, have a very uh, higher um, spatial resolution. Um, but then there are the limitations there of the cost of some of those, um, those data as well. Uh, so 
there are some limitations to think about if you're working um, on a on very small regions. Um, okay. All right, I think we'll do one more and then we'll close for the day um, and I'll get to these um, later on. So last question, question 14, um, which vegetation index could be sensitive for forest evergreen in tropical areas when NDVI is not too sensitive? Um, so EVI is a, is a great uh, alternative. Um, the uh, NDVI tends to saturate at high biomass regions, um, and those are oftentimes tropical regions. Um, so EVI is, a, is oftentimes a better option. Um, we also talked about the, the uh, modified EVI. Um, if you don't have um, satellite data or don't have that, um, um, those particular bands needed, uh, the um, um, blue band, I believe, for the standard EVI calculation. Um, but that, that's, a, that's a good option, um, looking at EVI as opposed to NDVI um, in, in tropical regions. Um, great. So I want to thank you all um, again for being here with us today um, and for being with us for the entire series. Um, you will be getting an email with the survey, so do please provide us feedback um, about that. Um, we have uh, uh, our, our next webinar coming up is a water resources webinar that um, is being shown here on the screen now. Um, if you all are interested in uh, water budgets for river basin management, uh, the next training uh, in line for the um, Eco forecasting is a uh, remote sensing of coastal ecosystems. So that's happening at the end of August, starting at near the end of August. So do please come back for, for that as well. Um, and, and once again, uh, the Q&A will be posted to the course website um, and we will have links to um, the uh, Spanish homework soon, as well as the recordings for, for all of these trainings on there as well. And, um, I do hope um, that you enjoyed the series and that you join us again for uh, another RSET um, training. So um, have a nice day, everyone.